This is Dr. Bess Miller, and I'm here with Dr. R.J. Simons. Today's date is July 12, 2018, and we are in Atlanta, Georgia, at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. I am interviewing Dr. Simons as part of the Oral History Project, The Early Years of AIDS, CDC's Response to a Historic Epidemic, The PEPFAR Years. We are here to discuss your experience during the early years of CDC's work on PEPFAR, the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief. Dr. Simons, do I have your permission to interview you and to record this interview? Yes, you do. I've worked for you and with you since the very early days of PEPFAR RJ, and it's a pleasure to be able to reflect on this with you today. During your career at CDC, you've had a leadership role for many different aspects of HIV AIDS treatment and prevention, both domestically and internationally. For today's interview, we'll focus on your work on prevention of mother-to-child transmission, or PMTCT, that began pre-PEPFAR, and then your positions leading the implementation of PEPFAR. Let's begin with your background. Would you tell me about where you grew up, your early family life, and then where you ended up going to college? Yes, sure. Thank you, Bess. Um, I grew up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, actually a suburb of Pittsburgh, um, where my uh, parents moved when we were uh, very young children. I gr grew up in a family of uh, initially five, and then we had a foster brother move in with us uh, to make a sixth child. Uh, so it was a busy family uh, uh, and uh, very educationally oriented family in, uh, in, a, in a school district that was competitive and really brought the best out of its students. Um, I went from there uh, to the University of Pittsburgh for one year. Um, I was in one of the areas that I was interested in, in in high school was Chinese, and I went on to become a to start be, beginning to study Chinese in, in Pittsburgh. Um, and after one year in, in school at the University of Pittsburgh, uh, decided it was time to get out of town, um, and I transferred uh, as far away as I could find at the moment, which was uh, the University of California at Berkeley. Uh, drove across country in order to continue my Chinese studies there. When I got there, I realized that um, I, all they were teaching was classical Chinese, which didn't have any interest to me, and I ended up quickly changing my major to uh, geography, because I'd seen what, what a beautiful country the United States was on the way out. Uh, so I graduated with a, a degree in, uh, in geography, um, uh, which I th think appealed to me at the time as being a way of looking at patterns of things, you know, how, how the earth becomes what it is, and the uh, way that how humans interact with the, with the earth is in, in, in population level. Uh, which I believe piqued my interest eventually in epidemiology uh, as another way of looking at, uh, at patterns of things. Hmm. So how, what did you do next? How, where did medicine and medical school come in? Was okay. your, were, were there doctors in your family? Um, there were no doctors in my family except my older brother became a doctor, so there now is one other doctor in the family. Uh, we, m both of my parents were English majors, uh, which... Uh, ended up being more important than I realized um, at the time, um, but there were no there was no history of that in my family. It, it, in me, it emerged in a rather circuitous way. Uh -huh. um, uh, after graduating with a degree in geography, which I realized did not really lead to very many jobs, um, I wanted to re-pursue my interest in Chinese and went to Taiwan to study English and teach Chinese. Um, for a period of time. Uh, back then, when you traveled internationally, you bought a student ticket that had defined start dates and end dates. Uh, and I, although I liked my time there, I, I had to come back on a certain date. So I came back to Pittsburgh, drove a taxi, which actually did use my geography uh, <laughs> skills, uh, earned enough money to return to Taiwan. Uh, on my way to Taiwan, though, I stopped over in the University of Hawaii to attend summer school in linguistics, which had become an interest, having studied the language. Um, that, that's important for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, uh, one of the courses I took was uh, neurolinguistics, the interface between the brain and language, and that was my first introduction to kind of the human body and, and, and the in inner workings of the human body. Um, 
it also introduced me to my wife, which was very important for the whole rest of my life. Um, but in terms of getting me from geography to medicine, it was the link with neurolinguistics that then led me to um, go back to school to study something that I thought I could get a job in, which was um, doing uh, EEG technology, so measuring, being, being the person who puts electrodes on your head to measure brain waves. That was interesting because of the neuro side of it, but it also got me into the hospitals for the mm -hmm. first time, and, mm -hmm. and, and that exposed me to the world of medicine, and at some point, I realized that, um, whereas before I'd perceived doctors as like a different species of people, I realized I could probably, I could probably do that, um, and so it ended up um, that I um, was working as an EEG technologist back in Hawaii because my wife continued her schooling in Hawaii, um, and I ended up going to the University of Hawaii School of Medicine um, because we were living there and because I had been introduced in through my EEG uh, world to there. So that got me into um, medical school, which uh, was, uh, because of all the circuitous pathway, I was an older student, yeah. um, and it was, I, I realized that that was very useful because it, uh, rather than be out um, doing the mating game, I could be studying and raising our son and, and uh, being very diligent with my studies um, to get through medical school. That's fascinating. How, how the international bug wanting to study Chinese and go to China just from deep within? Was, were there refugee grandparents? No, no okay, thank you. Uh, no, um, no, my, no refugee grandparents. We, my parents were very, um, li were liberal and open-minded. We, we were in a community where, uh, and this was in the 1960s, mm -hmm. when there was a lot of social activism. Uh, my parents were involved in a lot of the social movements of the time, um, and in particular, there were a lot of uh, interface with international groups through our church, um, and were some some exposure to the international world. Um, but I think the Chinese studies actually came from the offering of Chinese in my high school by a former French teacher who was there, and he was a very likable and a very very impressionable teacher. And I took Chinese in order to study from from Mr. Mannion, who was the French teacher. And that, so it was a rather uh, serendipitous move into international um, uh, world. That's just incredible. So after med school, um, what happened next? Well, during medical school, I came across um, the opportunity to, I, I came across an advertisement in a newspaper for, or a magazine for doing an elective at CDC. You, you, you could do a student elective at CDC, and I said, that, that, that's kind of interesting. I, I, think I'll, I think I'll apply for that. So I, I actually came to CDC when I was a senior in medical school, um, spent two months um, first in the Division of Viral Diseases, uh, working with um, uh, doing, trying to do some analysis of Kawasaki's disease uh, but then got involved in a, uh, there was an outbreak investigation opportunity, uh, so I was able to be uh, a, a, an active participant in that. Um, it turned out to not, un unlike most of the outbreaks that took you to far-flung places, this was an outbreak in Atlanta, um, uh, but it was, it was an interesting outbreak of uh, uh, cryptosporidiosis in daycare centers in Atlanta, so I got to see both the mechanics of outbreaks, also some of the politics and sensitivities of dealing with, uh, uh, with uh, diarrhea in wealthy communities um, mm -hmm. and how that gets addressed and some of those uh, issues. So it was from that that I got the, I, I, I saw, I really like, this is kind of fun, um, uh, being able to do uh, investigative type work, solve problems, um, and, and it was not lost on me that the lifestyle of an epidemiologist, at least at that time, uh, did not involve night call um, and had a relatively um, defined um, uh, day. Mm -hmm. uh, that turned out to not be the case later on, but at the time that, that was an appealing uh, factor as well. So with that in the backdrop, I uh, decided I, 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 wanted to go to, I wanted to work at CDC and I wanted to get into the EIS program, but I um, also realized that I wanted to 
have some sort of clinical background. So I went, ha having already had uh, one child and um, others on the way, uh, decided to uh, go into pediatrics to get a background in pediatrics before, um, before moving into public health. So I did four years of, uh, of pediatrics residency uh, with an eye towards you know, wanting to end up at, at CDC. Um, and, and I was uh, fortunate in that I was able to make that leap uh, to CDC. Wow, your, your preparation for CDC almost has a biblical uh, proportion, but very impressive. Um, so then you came to CDC, um, and this is 1990. Um, and by then, over 100,000 cases of AIDS have been reported in the United States. And we are getting reports of HIV from Africa and Asia, but don't have any idea of the magnitude of this. Um, I think by then, AZT had been approved, including for use in children, but there really isn't any significant movement in the treatment of AIDS in the U.S. Um, so tell us a little bit about your EIS assignment. Where were you assigned for EIS, and what did you do? Okay, thanks. Uh, the, I was assigned to the division of HIV AIDS, and in going, getting into EIS, as you know, it involves a matching process, and I, uh, when I was going around to all the groups to match, I was looking for something that could align my pediatric interest and, and experience with um, you know, something, that, mm -hmm. uh, uh, something useful at CDC. And so I was looking at uh, you know, vaccine-preventable diseases, diarrheal diseases, and there was a position open in the pediatric section, pediatric and family studies section of the division of HIV AIDS. And so I went to talk to them. I remember talking to uh, Jim Curran and Martha Rogers, and uh, they seemed all very nice people. And, but I, and I expressed my, the fact that doing my pediatric residency in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, had very little exposure to AIDS in children. In fact, I had like two patients that I had ever taken care of with HIV, and I said, I, I don't, you know, I'm, I don't really don't know anything about HIV. And I remember Jim Curran saying, ah, RJ, don't worry about that. A few years ago, nobody knew anything. You'll catch on. Um, and so I ended up matching with, uh, with the Division of HIV AIDS and the Pediatric and Family Studies section, which was led by um, Margaret Oxtoby. Mm -hmm. um, so, I, so I joined that team. I was the um, I had replaced, a, there was an EIS officer before me, I replaced her um, and you know, began my, my EIS work in doing um, uh, a few projects uh, uh, related to HIV and children. Uh, one of them in particular was, in the, early on, was uh, uh, given data on, the, on PCP in children, so pneumocystis crinii pneumonia, is one of the opportunistic infections that was you know, commonly associated with immunosuppression in HIV. And in children, it was the most common AIDS-defining uh, condition. And the, um, doing an analysis of the AIDS reporting data, a very simple analysis of looking at the age at which children were diagnosed with pneumocystis crinii pneumonia, showed a very dramatic and interesting pattern, which was it, there was a huge peak at three to six months of age uh, when children got uh, uh, PCP. And um, where, where, you know, if you look at all of the cases of PCP in children, the majority of them were occurring in this rather narrow age uh, group, <coughs> which, gave, which had important implications for policy, and it was my kind of first link to, to um, the experience of having data shed light on policy and, 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 um, and how we could, we could make that link. The, um, one of the important issues with, with HIV in children is the diagnosis of HIV. It requires, whereas adults can be diagnosed with a, a blood test that detects the antibodies to uh, HIV in the, in the body, and in adults that, is, that e equates with, equa with, uh, with infection, in children whose antibodies pass on from their mothers, if their mother's infected, but in the, in the case of children who, without any intervention, will, about a third of them will get, will get infected with HIV, but about two-thirds will not, the antibody test doesn't tell you 
definitively. In fact, it's not a very good marker of infection up until about 18 months of age. So because it could still be the mom's. It could still be the mom's uh, infection. Uh -huh. So you can yeah. tell that the mother has infection, but you can't tell without doing special testing of the yeah. virus itself whether the baby's infected. So here you have these, these um, and, and there was a, you could prevent PCP by using um, a trimethoprim sulfa or Bactrim as a, as a drug. So figuring out, well, how do you prevent HIV in children who, before you can even diagnose HIV uh, in children, um, uh, you know, became a, an important issue. And recognizing that, that the only way you're going to do this is by uh, tr aggressively using these viral tests, the, the PCR test in, in particular, which measures the, the DNA of the virus, by pushing, but the, by, by only, it's only going to be by doing that early on, you know, shortly after birth, that you're really going to be able to definitively detect infection in order to start children on, on prophylaxis to prevent PCP. And that, and initially that was impractical okay. because uh, you, you just couldn't do it. So the, so the approach, the policy approach was to actually start all children whose mothers were HIV infected on the prophylactic medicine, the trimethoprim sulfa, and then take it, you know, once, if they were diagnosed as not having infection, then you could stop the, um, stop the prophylaxis. So continuously for months at a time. Yes, yes, regardless of, you know, and in, in, in most cases, it's not gonna be doing anything because it's, uh, the child's actually not infected, but you don't know that. Um, and, and then, so um, was this a part of a U.S. Public Health Service guideline that came yes, out? Yes, this, 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 this led to, uh, there, was a, there were several sets of uh, guidelines, as, particularly as diagnosis got improved and you could do different things. But it, it got me involved in a, you know, in a kind of watching, watchful way rather than the active, active policymaker way um, to see how you, how you came up with the right um, uh, set of recommendations that were, were balancing these different, these different things of sensitivity and specificity of the test, of, of over-treating uh, versus missing cases um, and all that. And so I got very, you know, I got involved with, uh, with helping writing those guidelines and then also doing additional research um, in that area. So was it, was it controversial among AIDS pediatric clinicians at the time? Uh, was that broadly supported or do you remember what some of the thinking, this is before it was possible to easily do PCR testing of, of babies? Yes, this, this was before, two th it, it was the, be the beginnings of the ability to do PCR testing were there. So I think they, the studies showing that this actually was a good tool for for diagnosis were around 1989, 90, mm. I think Jimmy mm -hmm. O and Martha Rogers mm -hmm. writing, pa writing papers on that. Mm -hmm. But it was not available widespread. Um, uh, and so the, uh, the, by far the standard, the most standard approach was diagnosing HIV. If you diagnosed HIV in a pregnant woman, um, that then the, if you had the proper linkage to care of the baby, you, you could start prophylaxis on the baby. Some of the controversies were not really around the therapy. It's the prophylactic treatment itself was not terribly controversial. It was cheap. It didn't have much side effects, but the but it um, uh, but the the operational issues of identifying and and uh, and providing that uh, to to the children's caretakers on the basis of the mother's diagnosis was more complicated than it might seem. Mm -hmm. One of the things that did do, though, was push the issue, uh, well, it, it contributed to um, the controversy ar around testing pregnant women for HIV when there was no treatment. So this was a time when there was not effective uh, treatment and not a widely available treatment, and, why, um, mm -hmm. and not knowing what to do in, in the context of pregnancy. Um, by now having something that you can do mm. to help the health of the child, it added to the po positive side of the equation of, of, of getting tested for, for pregnant women who might otherwise be thinking, well, why should I do this if it's gonna mm. lead to stigma and discrimination, loss of job, people find out. Um, now you have more reason to be testing um, during pregnancy, which ended up being an, a, an important forerunner to then when you really had the opportunity to prevent transmission to children that you needed, you, know, you needed a system that was able to be diagnosing women uh, uh, 
well. Moving on to, to um, preventing mother-to-child transmission, later on in your EIS or just after that, I know you were involved in several multi-site studies on prevention of mother-to-child transmission in the United States. Can you tell us a little bit about those studies and what, how it led to which recommendations? Sure. Um, the, there were a number of, um, uh, it was recognized pretty early on in the AIDS epidemic that children got HIV, children could be infected with HIV through pregnancy or childbirth or breastfeeding. So that we, you know, that clearly there were children getting infected and it was very closely linked epidemiologically to their mothers being infected. So um, that was known. What wasn't so clear, um, in fact, I still think it's not entirely clear, as to why most children don't get infected. You know, wh why is it that only, you know, only about a third of children um, who were born to HIV-infected mothers actually get infected themselves? Um, and and the, the basic issues needed to be sorted out, like what is the rate, what is the risk of, of infection to a child born to an HIV-infected mother? How, what's, what percentage of children get infected? Measuring that rather, you know, to, to some level of precision is useful. What are the risk factors? What do we know about mothers you know, who are more or less likely to transmit to their children? Um, what happens to children who are HIV infected? What is their clinical course? How long do they live? What, what symptoms do they have? All that required epidemiologic study. So a number of multi-site studies were formed. Um, they, they were beginning before I, became to, before, before I came to CDC. Um, multi-site studies that brought together enough patients that could get a, you know, si enough of a size to get the right estimates for some of these things. We were, CDC had a uh, multi-site study called the PACTS study. Um, peri I think it was Perinatal AIDS Collaborative Transmission Study or something like that. Uh, five sites, uh, Atlanta, Baltimore, a couple in New York, um, and somewhere else, <laughs> uh, five, uh, five sites um, that uh, uh, c collaborated and on, on measuring, on enrolling women, uh, measuring um, th factors about them, uh, and then following their children. And I, Nathan Schaefer, when I started CDC, was the project officer on that, and mm -hmm. I, I joined up with him. And, and uh, when he moved off to work in Thailand, and mid-1990s, I took over as uh, the PI on that study. That was very important because those studies were being done at the time when, in 1994, the, 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 the seminal study on preventing mother-to-child transmission, the, the NIH-funded ACTG076 study came out that showed that um, uh, it, by giving mothers the drug AZT uh, during pregnancy, from early pregnancy till the end of pregnancy, giving them intravenous AZT during labor and giving the child AZT for six weeks, you could reduce HIV, the risk of HIV transmission from mothers to children by about two thirds. And it was that finding that led to huge, you know, all many, many, many things um, that I think we'll be talking about. But that was a, um, but that, that having these studies available and having these research collabor collaborations um, in place allowed you to begin examining lots and lots of other factors um, uh, related to preventing mother-to-child transmission um, that you couldn't have done if you were just starting from scratch. Mm -hmm. So the findings of your multi-site studies uh, on maternal and child transmission, were these with an intervention or just observational? Well, these were observational up until the intervention became, when the, when the 076 study came out, then suddenly, you know, policy changed, practice and policy immediately changed. So you could, you could actually look at, at, uh, at the intervention itself and how it was being utilized in these cohorts and what the impact it had over time. Okay. Um, you could also look at um, th this issue of infant diagnosis. It allowed you to you know, have, a, have a population that you could test the sensitivity and specificity of ways of doing this early diagnosis mm. by measuring the DNA or the antigens in the, in the children. 
Um, so these multi-site studies were not controlled trials, they were really observational studies? No, they were observational studies. studies. And then you, you added the intervention when it became approved. Right, 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 uh -huh. right, right. Of course, the 076 study itself was a similar observational study, but it, it provided that, it, it was a placebo-controlled study and, and showed and provided the intervention to, uh, to half of the women. CDC was not doing that type of study in the U.S. Um, okay. uh, around that. Okay. So, um, again, at this time, um, you know, 95, 96, mm -hmm. um, in the U.S., there's still very limited scale up of treatment. In 1970, or 1996, um, the uh, treatment improved began improving a lot. The, the, the use of triple drug th combination therapy and the recognition of the ability of new drugs to dramatically reduce viral load um, in, in people with HIV infection led to growth, you know, rapid growth in the, in the coverage of, uh, uh, on treatment in the, in the U.S. Although for pregnant women, uh, the, it was the AZT that began the, um, uh, to be uh, the intervention that would be used for pregnant women because of its preventing mother-to-child mm -hmm. transmission benefits. The, in the in initial times of treatment, the, there, were, there were CD4 cutouts and cutoffs of using treatment. So people who were relatively well uh, asymptomatic would not be started on treatment because the treatment was re reserved for the sicker people. Mm -hmm. And in general, pregnant women were not in that category, okay. just by the demographics and, okay. and like who gets pregnant, uh, mm -hmm. and so there, it was a it was a relatively small proportion of pregnant women who would have been started on treatment in, initially. Okay, um, interesting. It, More to come on that. Um, so then you went to Thailand. Is that right? What? Yeah. How did that come about? Well, how that came about, there's a few steps, a few important landmarks then. So with this 076 study in February of 1994, uh, at that time I had, uh, I had become the uh, chief of the pediatric and family studies section. The, um, and, and, and our section then, particularly working with the surveillance branch and the division of HIV AIDS, was looking then at, at our surveillance data and saying, okay, well, what do we, you know, can we, T two aspects of the surveillance data. One, the case surveillance of, of, of AIDS. Can we see what, what's happening now as women are starting to use AZT? Are we seeing a drop off in, in cases of AIDS in children? Um, because remembering that the, the, epi the epidemiologic curve of, of AIDS in children was very front loaded because of all these PCP cases. Children were becoming, children got, the, the, the time between infection and AIDS was much shorter in children than in adults. And so the opportunity to see the impact of stopping prevention then was very high in children because you could see for, for pretty quickly are you making a dent in the number of uh, AIDS cases. So we did careful analyses of the, um, of the uh, AIDS surveillance data, um, the childbearing women survey that um, was in place to, that helped measure the prevalence of HIV in mm -hmm. women and, and, and pregnant women uh, became an important uh, tool to give you the, the uh, estimates of well, how many people need this treatment in the United States, and so those kinds of analyses. But um, looking at the international side then, see what CDC also did was uh, launch two parallel studies taking the intervention that was used in the ACTG076 trial, AZT, which was cumbersome in its length and its cost and its use of intravenous uh, formulations during labor and trying to see if you could get also get an impact if you reduce that down to make it a more feasible um, all oral um, and um, shorter and cheaper intervention. So two studies were launched to look at a shorter version of AZT to see it, if it could prevent mother to child transmission also. And um, those two studies, one was done in Thailand and one was done in uh, Cote d'Ivoire, um, were launched around 90, 
596, mm -hmm. um, and continued for about two years before they were able to be able to show that, in fact, yes, even a shorter version of the AZT regimen uh, could reduce transmission to mother uh, from mothers to children. And so then, my my career change on this was that right around the time, so these studies, the study in Thailand, which Nathan Schaefer was the PI on, um, uh, wrapped up in early 1998, showing that, yes, this worked. Um, and these were placebo controlled. These were placebo right? controlled trials. Yeah, these were, and there was a lot of pressure on that because the, uh, you now had a, you had to balance uh, getting a quick and a quick and definitive answer about what magnitude of reduction in transmission you would have um, by comparing this short course intervention to the standard of care, which at the, at the time was no intervention, or do you compare it to the ACTG regimen, which was not being carried out in these countries and was likely unlikely to ever be the final policy in these countries because you wanted to make sure that nobody, that everybody got something. Mm -hmm. And it was a very controversial um, uh, period in time and very interesting debates around that. But it led to, uh, obviously, for many reasons, a pressure to try to, you know, let's see, how, we need to do these, we need to make sure these trials get done in time and get done accurately and, and, uh, and show definitive results. And fortunately, they did. Uh, the government of Thailand um, took, the, you know, they, they quickly, um, moved this into national policy, and I was fortunate enough to be able to take a position. Nathan, Nathan's term ended in Thailand in 1998, right as, as the trial was ending. I came behind him taking the position, a CDC position in the CDC office in Thailand and worked closely with the Ministry of Public Health and, uh, on scaling up their program um, uh, first doing a regional program and showing that this, you know, it could be implemented, setting up a national monitoring system, um, doing some research around women's attitudes towards, tr towards, towards treatment, uh, how to do counsel, proper counseling and issues like that. So lots of implementation science type work. So, um, well, before, before we had this interview, I was, I was going to ask you, wow, why, why Thailand? Where did this international bug come, but now we, we know that it, it was there in you for a long time. Um, still, this represented a huge uh, commitment, and you had how many kids by then? Three. Three. Um, teenagers. Teenagers, yeah. So how did that, how did that go in terms of getting, getting everyone over there and committed, and your wife, was she supportive? Um, yeah, uh, How did that happen? Uh, very good question. Um, uh, it, re it happened, you know, it clearly started, the idea of going to Thailand for our family clearly originated with me. None of my kids came up with that independently. Um, uh, my wife, being Japanese, was, had, uh, it was, had a more favorable openness to moving to an Asian country than maybe she would have had to move into an African country. Um, none of my family had been to Thailand before. Uh, I had been a couple of times, uh, had sent pictures, had you know, shown them, told them about my stories. Um, but it represented, a, 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 you know, an important, obviously, as you said, an important change for my family. And um, I think the, the uh, my wife and I thought that this would be an opportunity for our children to see something new while they are in a in a in an age an age where they could learn a lot from it. Um, that we also were aware that um, it, we're very privileged when we do our overseas assignments with CDC. We get taken care of. We're allowed to attend international schools. A very you know the educational the educational um, Opportunities were more positive than negative mm -hmm. for the children to be going to an international school, uh, and so as a, as parents, we agreed that this would be a, a a positive family move. The kids took a little bit of more convincing. Um, uh, my daughter, who was old enough to be very articulate already, asked me, "So, so, Dad, was this?" Are you? Did you have a choice in going to Thailand? To, was it your decision to? 
take your take your children, rip them away from their friends, and send them to a foreign country, or what? Um, and so, you know, we had to have some diplomatic discussions about uh, about this. And in the end, uh, I think all of my family was very, very appreciative of the opportunity to, uh, that CDC provided to be living overseas, to be exposed to a new lifestyle, to make new friends that now are still friends uh, after many, many years, and to really, in Thailand it's in particular, to learn about what great people uh, the people of Thailand are. And um, it's, it's been, from our family perspective, although there was, there was you know, getting, getting into it, it took some negotiation, um, everyone sees this as, a, as having been a very positive experience. So that's kind of 2020 hindsight. What was it like when you first got there? Now, I should say you were joining the U.S. Thai Field Station yes. in Thailand, which had been established in 1990. Yes. Was Bruce Weniger still? Uh... He was not there. Yeah, he'd started at uh, uh -huh. Tim Mastro. Tim Mastro. F followed him. Tim Mastro was the country director okay. when, I, uh, when okay. I arrived there. So he was your boss? Yes, he was my boss. Yeah. Um, so how did that, uh, how did just getting, getting going, um, totally 100% new, new world experience? Uh, had the kids traveled at all? To they had countries? traveled. They had been to Japan, for ah, instance. Okay. Uh, so they had. And their mom was Japanese. Yes. So they, is Japanese. I, I didn't mention that as maybe part of the international. Well, that, yeah. that maybe was a, an outcome rather than an yeah. input for the. Right. For the, um, yeah. Uh, it was, uh, uh, you know, everything, like you say, everything was new for everybody. Uh, moving into a new house, a new, we lived in a townhouse that was directly across the road from our school, which is very convenient. Um, new food. New money, new food, you know, new language. Um, uh, it was tough. And my wife did not, she, my wife, who's a professor at Georgia Tech, she, we, we were going for a three-year term, we agreed that as a family that was probably about the right time, the right amount of time. She could only take two years leave of absence. So the first year she came but had to, had to go back for the school season and, 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 and was, was gone a lot, of the, a lot of that time. Fortunately, there's, there's a lot of, there was a lot of support. Um, we had a, a live-in uh, maid who cooked and cleaned for us, uh, which was you know, obviously a blessing. Um, the school itself, being being in the neighborhood of the school, there are a lot of families, and the kids could go walk to school and back mm. and forth with no problem. Mm. So there it wasn't. Um, mm -hmm. th there were solutions to most of the challenges. Um, at work, uh, I it was to me it was just like a ble it was like all this exciting new stuff. I mean, they, we had programmatically it was really cool to be be doing something extremely positive um, uh, in terms of program implementation, which was no longer. Just research, but actually doing something, um, meeting, being being a manager of people from another culture, and trying, you know, just learning how to talk to people and what works and what doesn't work, and uh, trying myself to learn Thai as best that I could. Um, so um, you were there. You were there, not doing a study. You were doing implementation of programs. Both. Both, uh -huh. both. We were. So, what were what were you studying? What were some of the um, implementation science well, things we had, you worked uh, on? The, the 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 short course AZT study that I mentioned that was done in Thailand. Um, it fo actually followed a, a, a prior observational cohort study. So, as I was mentioning before, the, having these observational studies up and running. A, was a prelude and an opportunity to really move quickly to inserting an intervention. And then in the case when I got there of then observing what happens when the intervention is being, um, is being used. So we developed a strong collaboration with a, with a children's hospital in, um, in Bangkok and Siri Rot Hospital in Bangkok in particular with a, you know, a defined organizational structure for research, research nurses that were posted at the sites, um, just lots of, there, there's, a, there's a real infrastructure there for continuing the next phase of things to look at um, you know, what happens. Um, and we were uh, looking at issues like um, uh, you know, some of these testing issues, what can you, can we um, make available and um, uh, utilize the PCR testing effectively, um, what, 
how are women dealing with infant feeding? In, in Thailand, they, as a national policy of providing infant formula so that HIV-infected women did not breastfeed, wanted to know, well, how is that going? Did that okay. work? Um, so those kind of, of things, how, how is the implementation being used um, uh, in, in people attending these major hospitals in, 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 uh, in Bangkok? We also did a regional implementation um, study where we um, implemented this regimen in a, one of the 12 health regions in Thailand and observe, you know, collect the data on the uptake, you know, how many women got tested of the, of the estimated number that there were there, how many got started on treatment, what were some of the reasons they didn't get started on the AZT, um, um, that kind of thing. And we also set up a, a national monitoring system for mm. these, these indicators, which uh, actually one of the things I'm most proud of is that that's still in place. So mm. it started in 2000 and now nearly 20 years later, they're still using that 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 system so that that system would would monitor what would monitor the um, uptake of the use of the interventions okay. in the women so like and it in Thailand it's always very high numbers 95 percent 98 percent but then be able to look at the hospitals you know which hospitals are not doing so well or which regions are not doing so well um, so um, just to step step back from from that those specifics what was what was AIDS like in Thailand when you got there? Um, what what were people seeing in the hospitals in general? Um, what was healthcare delivery like for people with AIDS in Thailand? Um, um, how I mean, we many of us know Africa pretty well, but perhaps not as well. What was going on in Thailand? Well, first of all, the epidemic in Thailand. Um, <clears throat> Uh, was fueled by the, I think the initial really uh, explosion of the HIV epidemic in Thailand was due to its rapid transmission through both sex work and injecting drug use. Um, and so you, and then that with the increasing numbers of infected people who then were having sexual contacts with people outside the risk groups, um, you know, was the infection was spreading into the general population. Um, Thailand was also uh, famous for having had very good interventions to reduce um, transmission, particularly in brothels, through combining uh, the police and the brothel owners and the public health world to come up with you know 100 percent condom use policies, where uh, and anyone going into a brothel would be uh, it would be standard practice to be using a a condom, and if that didn't happen, you had the police or the owners. You know, everybody would, was conspiring to have public mm. health, have better health um, mm. in that setting. So that led to a you know a decline in these high risk groups. But you then now had a more general population that was already becoming infected. Um, because of the high, because of it starting with the high risk groups, you um, like you we see in every country, um, the stigma associated with the risk groups immediately transfers into stigma associated with HIV. So, you know, the idea that if you had HIV, you know, may, it probably means you, you, know, were, you were doing something that was socially unacceptable. And so you had, you had a, you know, a lot of the issues of hiding your infection, not, you know, not telling your husband if you're an infected woman, uh, or needing help to do that, um, um, keeping um, information from um, the schools, um, uh, even ke even keeping information from healthcare um, centers. In terms of the care, um, the system, the healthcare system in Thailand is was is well organized. It, it goes you, uh, down to the district level. You had health centers, and you had places where you could do the kind of primary care needed, such as HIV testing. You, know, you could test. You, you didn't have to go somewhere else to get a test, you could get tested relatively locally, and that was an important um, mm. feature. Uh, it had a, you know, the, the system itself was organized, which allowed the scale up of, of the PMTCT interventions relatively quickly, because you had an authority structure that went from national to regional to provincial to mm. hospital, and people, you know, follow, it was generally follow guidance, um, and so if you had the right guidance and the right incentives and the right and enough resources, the system itself 
worked well enough to be able to um, um, implement. Uh, Were there enough that. resources? What was the economic situation during those years in mm -hmm. Thailand? Well, Thailand, um, Thailand had a big, and, I, and the rest of Asia had a big crash in around 1997, shortly before I got there. And so there were, there, it was kind of coming out of that during the years when I was there. The, uh, there were, so there were never enough resources. Um, that was always an issue. But there was generally uh, an openness to uh, addressing the AIDS epidemic. There was nobody saying, no, let's not address this. Mm -hmm. um, uh, mm -hmm. It was very hel helpful to have quantifiable needs, like how many, so how many people do we need to test, or how many doses of drugs do we need, or how much infant formula do we need to buy. And some of these mm -hmm. monitoring systems were useful mm -hmm. in providing that kind of uh, data so that a planning cycle could, you know, eventually get, in improve the ability to meet, um, to meet the needs. There was also um, a very strong and useful component of in, in the NGO world, the, particularly the Thai Red Cross was uh, actively um, addressing HIV infection, and they could raise funds through other, you know, through um, private means. Uh, they had they also uh, one uh, one unique aspect in Thailand, or not unique, but one important aspect in Thailand is its royalty. You know, it's a it's a kingdom, mm -hmm. and, the, mm -hmm. and the respect that the royalty has, and the Thai Red Cross. Was very, you know, uh, very linked in with the um, uh, with the hierarchy in Thailand, so it received a lot of um, of, of uh, support. So having that, the NGO component there as well, there wasn't so much. I think there was external technical inputs, but like for instance, the the U.S. didn't support the implementation. We supported the technical aspects of this, but we weren't supporting the buying of the commodities or the hiring of all the staff and all that. We were, we, 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 we weren't, they, that all came indigenously. Mm -hmm. um, some small grants from mm -hmm. organizations, but in general it came from the, from the, the government. Um, uh, and so they were, it was a really, a really, for me, a really good combination of things where you, um, you know, you could, you could use technical input, but you didn't have to like be dealing with all of the um, money. You know, de you know, dealing you didn't have to be advocating for large sums of funds back to to anybody because they were being generated uh, indigenously. Okay. Did you end up becoming friends with Thai staff there or? Thai colleagues. Well, was, a, was was there acceptance of of you and your family and other U.S. quote unquote expats from from CDC and elsewhere? I think CDC had a CDC had and still has a positive um, image there. It's one of the bigger, in fact, it may be the biggest U.S. government presence in Thailand in terms of all of its staff, including its locally employed staff. Um, it. Uh, the staff that wor work, it's, it's, since the office has been there a long time, as you mentioned, since 1980, 90, there, yeah. 90, uh, there are people who have uh, been there for a really long time. Like, in fact, some of my close colleagues that were there starting around the same time that I was starting are still there, and I'm still in touch with them. Um, and they are, they, they're, they're growing through the system. They're, they're leaders in, in, in the, you know, in the system now. And, mm -hmm. and so the answer, so I, I, I met a lot of people that I, I stay in contact with. Um, when, when I get a chance to go to Thailand, I see uh, colleagues regularly. Mm -hmm. um, and so it had a very, you know, it added a large layer of new friendships and colleagues to mm -hmm. my, um, to my um, career richness. Mm -hmm. Um, what about the embassy? Did you relate to the embassy? Um, was that a big it, it, part of CDC life in Bangkok? For me, no, um, for, for a couple of reasons. One, the CDC office was housed in the Ministry of Public Health, which was a little bit of a, a bit of a hike from the embassy. Um, uh, it, and so on a day-to-day -day basis, I wasn't like going to work at the embassy or even going, I wasn't living near the embassy. I mean, I would go there for things like um, uh, going to the com commissary or doing administrative things or the medical office. 
but in general, not so much. And, and then my position was not, I wasn't representing CDC at meetings. The director would be going to those kinds of okay. meetings. So I wasn't having that kind of contact. I mean, we had a fair amount of contact and knew a lot of people there, but I wasn't, mm -hmm. um, uh, I wasn't, I didn't feel like I was, I felt a lot more like I was part of the CDC family or even more of the Ministry of Public Health family, mm -hmm. um, just because of who I saw every day. Mm -hmm. Anything else you want to tell us about your experience in Thailand? It sounds like it was wonderful. Um, it was, uh, yes, it was very, uh, I, I mean, I couldn't have, I, to me it's, it was very important for my, uh, my life, my career and my family, I think, gained a lot from it. Um, like, I, like you know, keeping, having friends that I, uh, and colleagues that are, you know, lifelong. Um, it, and it, it, it actually, annoyed, you know, not purposely, but it ended up being that experience of scaling up PMTCT mm -hmm. in Thailand then became, you know, you know, now later on became what we, the United States was assisting with in many, many other countries. So mm -hmm. having the experience of first in the U.S., dealing with scaling up in the U.S., although we didn't really call it scaling up, um, but the growth of the interventions in the U.S., uh, working in Thailand, scaling up, really gave, gave me a kind of unique uh, ex exposure to a bigger structure of what it takes to do a public health program than maybe what it takes to take care of a patient or what it takes mm -hmm. to, to even run, in a, run a hospital. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so I, and I re at, the, at the time, I was just doing my job every day, but then in retrospect, you realize that you were seeing and participating in a, in a system that, um, that uh, needs to be changed or that needed to be changed in, in, in order to address the AIDS epidemic. And then later on, it became an important, important experience to be able to apply it to um, bigger things that were going to happen. Mm -hmm. So you came back at an interesting time as well. Um, and at that point, were sort of pre-PEPFAR, um, the beginning of the LIFE initiative. So CDC and the U.S. government had really made n very minimal efforts towards global AIDS in the 90s, struggling with our cases. And this was sort of prior to 1999. And then things began to change in 1999. And at that time, President Clinton launched the so-called Life Initiative, leadership in, finding, in fighting an epidemic. And this was a U.S. government HIV AIDS initiative. Can you tell us just briefly about what that was and, and what was its main focus? The, the Life Initiative, which was happening, I, I, I wasn't... It, it wasn't so related to, it started when I was in Thailand mm -hmm. um, and, and my, it didn't connect directly with Thailand. Um, so I wasn't personally engaged at the beginning of it, but what it ended up doing was providing CDC with funding, I think in, in the $35 million range or something to be able to, to start new offices and presence and activities in a larger number of countries. As you say, up before then we, had um, relatively small presence overseas. We had a Thailand office, Kenya. Uh, we had a, somebody in South Africa. We had Uganda, Cote d'Ivoire, um, but not that many. The Life Initiative provided the resources to start. I think we had about 13 country offices uh, that were to in, in total that either got they got a boost with these funds or allowed us to actually place new people to. Um, to new sites, to new countries, and, and at the time it was, um, uh, you know, just all a lot of it. A lot of the issues were operational. Just you know, how do we find people, and how do we, you know, operate in a larger way in many different countries? We were relative amateurs. We were probably more than relative. We were amateurs in this um, field of operating overseas, having just a few countries that, and, and, a, and a relatively small number of people that knew how to do this. Um, and so we were scaling up our own capacity to 
um, work overseas, to become part of the embassy families, to work in an interagency way. Um, um, so the big, the big player international health was USAID. Yes. Um, and did they have a big, big part of this life initiative yes, yes. funding? So they, yes, they were. They, they were. It, uh, it was. Most of the funding went to USAID. Some of the funding went to CDC, and I believe a little bit may have gone to the Defense Department, but I can't recall for sure. Uh -huh. um, it allowed both agencies to expand our activities in HIV overseas. Uh -huh. um, and it allowed, you know, not knowing, not knowing the future, um, and it was, it, was not a, it was not like there was a commitment to 10 years of, of more and more and more funding. It was really all about getting started. Um, uh, and we, that allowed both uh, field offices to be set up, but then it led to a structural change at CDC headquarters of finding a home for international um, HIV AIDS. So the, the global AIDS program, initially it was a global AIDS activity, was started. Um, uh, CDC often does this, you know, pulling people from various places, you know, and then eventually formalizing um, uh, an organization. So the Global AIDS program was launched in the Life Initiative um, period um, as a focal point and with, with central leadership on, uh, on, on the global HIV, uh, um, per, uh, acti global HIV work, linked to in the same center as our domestic program, but now, now a self-governing you know, self um, external or uh, globally facing uh, organization. Mm -hmm. So I came back, when I came back in 2001, I, that, that Global AIDS program was just starting up and I, they were just starting a, you know, the structure, a form, more formal structure of that and, and I think there were four branches and I was the, I was named the uh, prevention branch chief. Mm -hmm. Prevention included prevention of mother to child transmission as well as, you know, other blood safety and sexual transmission and youth and, um, uh, S STD treatment for uh, so I was I was um, uh, I came back then into a branch chief position to help us do stuff. Uh, who were, who were your bosses then? Who was the uh, the program boss, the center director boss, yeah, and who was even the director of CDC at that time? Was there support for this this move towards a bigger? Bigger effort in HIV. Yes, the the uh, the, the division director was the Global AIDS program, but it, was, it operated as a division. Uh, was Eugene McRae. Um, he uh, uh, he was he had kind of began this began the leadership of this, and then formally was the was the leader. And uh, Helene Gale was the center uh, director, um, and she. Um, she was very supportive, and Carmine Bazzi was her deputy, and he was very involved in, um, in making all this happen and, and interfacing with the State Department and doing the, all the, you know, the interagency work that it required to you know, allow this to happen, you know, allow CDC to be doing work you know, in, in new areas and, and getting along with the other agencies and um, uh, doing all the operational parts of this. So the, 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 and the feeling was very much of a, of, a, of a new thing, a good thing. I mean, an interesting thing. You had people who, uh, a lot of people had some international experience um, uh, and were brought into this from the International Health Program Office or other places. Others were just you know, new, to the, new to the field and quickly, you know, quickly learned on the job about how to make things happen overseas. Now the CDC director was... Um, the CDC director at the time was, uh, well, th at the time of the life initiative starting, I believe it was still Jeff Copeland, and uh, Dr. Gerberding started, I, I believe Dr. Gerberding was there when the formal launching of the Global AIDS program. But mm -hmm. I, mm -hmm. But in general, the office of the director was supportive also of this? Yeah, I think everybody at CDC was either actively or, or passively supportive of this. Mm -hmm. It wasn't an uphill. It wasn't a, it, people weren't fighting uh -huh. too much over this. Now, anytime you start, you pull, right. pull things away, 
Um, uh, but having this be in the same center with a, the center director being very supportive, I think smooth, smooth things out. Later on, um, fast forwarding history, when the development of the Center for Global Health was, was um, or when the Center for Global Health was developed and growing and involving moving, moving now large divisions from one center to another, um, you know, those are, those are never easy and those require a lot of, you know, negotiation and discussing what the relative values of keeping everybody doing work in HIV together versus everybody doing work globally together. It's, mm -hmm. you, know, you have to make, mm -hmm. that, make decisions. So, um, what came next? The there was a, a large funding for a PMTCT initiative that uh, followed soon after. Can you put that in the context yes. of, of PEPFAR that yes. we're so, moving towards? So, so the, um, if, if we're, if we're life, life initiative starting 1999, 2000, uh, personally, I'm coming back, I, I began in the summer of 2001. Uh, getting, you know, getting a new division together, getting offices together, that was kind of occupying everybody, figuring out what a strategy is, what are we really doing. Um, um, we were all busy doing that. Uh, new election, President Bush uh, uh, comes in, um, and we started getting some, um, like, discussions, request, like data requests um, that were like, uh, well, you know what? How many people do you have out in the field, and uh, what's your budgets, and and uh, we, um, uh, what um, what do you think we could do? You know what what could we do if there were more if there was more money? You know a lot of things, and this doesn't this is not uncommon. You know in in new administrations to say you know get, get, start getting some ideas floated around. Um, and and I should say that that uh, just to interject a, a line here that um, one of the big issues was. Um, that the price of drugs was beginning to be negotiable and uh, and come down because the, the cost of treating AIDS at that time was ten to fifteen thousand dollars a year in the U.S. So um, I think I think you, at some point you might want to comment no, I, on I, the I'm impact right of now. that. That's a, I mean yeah. that 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 that's actually very important. And the Life Initiative was all about prevention. It was uh, it was the focus of it. There was little appetite for thinking about treatment over in other in, in resource poor countries at that time there's not very little experience with it the costs were very high um, and there was just maybe some lack of imagination or lack of, uh, of uh, thinking that this could be possible um, and that was um, that led to when when the life initiative was, was in place, the notion was, I mean, there was a lot of, at the same time that people realized there is treatment available in the U.S. and there's need for treatment available in other countries, and a lot of interest in, you know, what can we do? Can we, can we help, can't we help people? Can't we provide treatment for people? And see, then there was a lot, there was a tension about how far we could go with, with treatment um, uh, in our, in the life, in, in, under the life initiative, because we, we had a, there were there were opportunities like UNICEF had some small funding for pilot projects that you could start to see what treatment could be done in small populations and you know we were helping provide some technical assistance around that but we really were not in a position to be the U.S. government was not in a position to really be talking about treatment because we didn't want to as a country didn't want to like say yeah we can do this because um, nobody thought we really or people in power at the time did not think that they could be done. Um, that's what changed. Um, that so that the, the the drug costs beginning to come down, the, the development of generic drugs, just the continued improvement of drugs uh, formulations. Um, that's th there was a steady improvement along those lines, such that um, uh, it it took. Uh, there were people who began to see the future that this big gap that was only getting bigger as more and more people were infected, particularly in Africa, that were not on treatment, that this is only going to get worse. Um, there was beginnings of concern about this could be, become a security issue if 
if the productive segments of populations were getting were, were dying off, the teachers, the soldiers, the the business people were you know getting sick. This could have much bigger implications than just public health. Um, there was a uh, the evangelical community saw saw this as a you know a, a need that needed to be met, and that there was you know there. The, the idea that people were sick and dying um, when there was the possibility of, of treating nod on people. And so a lot of, a lot mm -hmm. of these factors came together that led to, eventually it led to PEPFAR um, that as, a, as a concept that was, was doable. I think there was, um, so we, we, we began hearing about you know, began having, you know, there were discussions with HHS about, you know, what could be done, et cetera. And then um, in the summer of 2002, uh, to everyone's surprise, um, there was this, there was an announcement that the U.S. government is going to do a $500 million um, mother, preventing mother to child transmission project in 14 countries. USAID and, and, and HHS um, were going to be the uh, joint leads on this, um, and uh, there were targets for how much prevention we're going to do, uh, and uh, and a structure set up for 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 um, how to govern across these agencies and how to work with the countries and things, and so that that changed a lot. That's all. That was a lot of money. Um, uh, Do you remember more. about about how much CDC got uh, um, from that five hundred million? No, but probably around you know a third or a fourth or something along that. Which is yeah. a, a lot of money which for is CDC. A, which is a, yeah, so it was a big. It was a big. It was an important factor in, in CDC, um, and because we had these countries were chosen such that CDC. Well, these these countries were chosen. In a in a way that ended up being you know a lot, CDC was was present in most of the places that were selected for this so which we hadn't been even before the Life Initiative so we had we were prepositioned almost to be able to be participants in the this PMTCT initiative when it came along um, working together with with USAID and this formed a you know real um, uh, partners you know a way of actually doing programming um, together you had resources you. You just had to figure out how to work together as agencies to, 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 to um, implement. So why CDC? In other words, so USAID has this long history. They have offices in country. They have a long record on uh, health system strengthening, healthcare infrastructure, nutrition. Um, what did CDC bring to this? And um, well, we're, CDC is the is the nation's prevention agency. Um, we have. We had, in terms of the AIDS epidemic in particular, we had great experience in uh, in responding to the you know the many issues about HIV in the U.S. We were um, we had a fair amount of although we didn't have offices places we had a fair we had you know a lot of international experience working with USAID you know we were often seconded with USAID or to WHO we were we had a lot of experience overseas. And we were deemed to be, you know, technically highly qualified to understand the issues. We had laboratorians, we had um, biomedical scientists. Uh, you know, we had all the, uh, the the technical capability that mm -hmm. was needed to to um, do this. And so the idea that we could, uh, you know, we should marshal all of the assets of the U.S. government to do something as big as this was, I think, the philosophy behind this. Like we were there. We had something to contribute. Mm -hmm. We should be doing it. So then, in two thousand three, President Bush announces PEPFAR. Um, you want to say a little bit about what the goals of PEPFAR was and the budget, and then maybe your earliest role mm -hmm. in implementing PEPFAR. Well, the PEPFAR was announced uh, in the State of the Union address in uh, two thousand and three. Uh, again, a very a, a extremely well kept secret before that announcement. Uh, if there were people at CDC who knew that was going to be announced, I'd never met them. Or they never s said uh, it was. So I I was watching it uh, as were <laughs> other people, and we're we're like, okay, 
suddenly, I, I understand, <laughs> I get it, you know, we're, we're going big. Um, uh, they, what was announced was briefly, um, and there was, like a lot of these in initiatives, you get a little bit, you know, you get a paragraph in the State of the Union address, but it's followed up by fact sheets and, you know, more, fi more fleshed out um, ideas. The, the, the basic construct of PEPFAR was it was uh, 14 countries were identified as focus countries. Um, there was a, uh, a commitment of $15 billion over five years that the president was going to ask Congress for. Um, the, there were targets. There was, uh, with these fundings in, in these countries, the, the expectation that 2 million people would be put on treatment, and that was in comparison to an estimated 50,000 that were on treatment uh, before that, so a, rep, a huge increase in, in, in that. Um, 7 million infections would be prevented, and 10 million people would be provided care, including orphans and orphans um, uh, who were orphaned from HIV. The, there was going to be a structure in place that had a central coordinator in the State Department. There was a, the President Bush wanted a go-to person say, who's, who knows, who's accountable for results and, and who um, uh, had the authority to allocate the funding, to um, uh, de develop and maintain our policies around PEPFAR, to represent the U.S. in, in the international forum around uh, HIV issues. So there was a defined structure, there were, there were goals, there was money, um, it, the, lots of pieces of, and then what was not stated but what was also present was there were, um, there were a lot of people who knew about H, a lot of, a lot of pent up uh, passion and energy and interest in help trying to solve the HIV epidemic and suddenly now you could do it. Suddenly it wasn't an issue of we need more money, we need more money. So now it was an issue of oh my gosh, you know, how do we do this and how do we actually um, uh, build up this, the health systems and able to, to provide this kind of, uh, uh, of service. It, uh, so my, my role in this initially, um, because I was the prevention branch chief uh, that oversaw the PMTCT team, um, and because the, it turned out that the PMTCT, this initial initiative, was linked mental, and I don't think it was pre-planned this way, but it was, it, it, the, the experience that was gained from that was a bit of a trial balloon to see, you know, could we really go, the, you know, could we really expand and could the U.S. government work together as a team um, uh, and carry out something bigger? Mm -hmm. um, and I had been involved in the PMTCT initiative, the steering committees and various parts of making that happen. Um, and then when this came along, still as the brand, when PEPFAR was announced, then that, you know, we had to, a lot of mobilization had to occur, and we were all getting involved then in figuring out, well, how do we, what, what is the structure of this? What are the technical working groups? And how do I plug in? How does everybody plug into this and mm -hmm. uh, in a whole new structure of things? Um, and as, as one of the branch chiefs, so I was, you know, just involved, everybody was involved in, in um, helping, like, what is this? And how is it? What are we supposed to do? And, and, and all those things. Um, I, pretty early on, I think around the summer, so maybe about six months into, after the announcement of the initiative, and, but, and the announcement of the initiative didn't mean the flow of the funds started. So they had, Congress had to enact a law uh, the money had to get to the agent. So th there, was, there was a period where there, this was a, an idea and a construct that needed to be done, but there wasn't actually the money yet to do it. Um, so there was some startup time there. Uh, but I, I had the opportunity. Uh, I got called by uh, Mark Dibel. Mark Dibel was, um, uh, worked in Tony Fauci's office in NIH, and, and he was... He was detailed to the HHS Office of Global Health Affairs to help develop and actually to be the rep HHS representative um, for the PMTCT initiative, um, uh, you know, the, kind of the lead, the HHS lead on the PMTCT initiative. And he, he had been asked then when PEPFAR started to be detailed in to serve, I believe is initially the deputy coordinator, um, but anyway, to be a lead person in the office, the new office of the Global AIDS Coordinator, that, op that left vacant his position as 
the HHS coordinator of this new growing HIV uh, initiative. So uh, he, he, he said, what, can, you come up, can you come up and help us with this, maybe a few months? Uh, and uh, I said, sure. Um, so I ended up being detailed up to Washington to work in the Office of Global Health Affairs under the director of the Office of Global Health Affairs, Bill Steiger, as the coordinator of the, the HHS agencies and kind of the representative, the kind of technical representative to all of the growing, the growing, in, the growing interagency structures in Washington that were, that were uh, leading this. And I ended up doing that for a year. Uh, I stayed living in Atlanta, but every week would go up for, you know, Monday through Friday up in Washington. You know, I used to see the same guys on the plane in the morning and, um, uh, and was doing that, you know, every week for, um, for a year. So, wow, um, we can't let that go by. You just blithely said, sure, I'll come on up. Um, <laughs> that sounds like it was quite a shift in what you'd been doing and well, an well, incredible the, well, there was, challenge. Uh, yeah, it didn't, it wasn't, that was a slight truncation of the story. Uh, uh, it, you know, obviously this had to be, uh, the idea of CDC deploying somebody up to do this was a larger discussion than just my personal situation. And others were supportive of my playing that. Others were supportive of A, CDC yeah. being involved with that. They saw sure. a tremendous value in having yeah. CDC being represented in the interagency discussions from the, and, and being in the department. Sure. Um, they thought that I could, you know, having been involved in the other stuff and being um, on a scale of d diplomatic to being a jerk, they felt like I was <laughs> far enough along on, on the on the on the side of being you know trustworthy up in that environment and uh, what about your personality are, are you I've known you but can you can you say what what about your personality worked for you in this setting and and what it took to sort of deal with the complex politics that were involved um, yeah I tried to think about that because I feel like your personality is part of you, and it's part of what people see about you, yeah. and it's part of, in an in a effort like this, and actually all public health where you're working as teams, the ability to work in a team um, and move things forward and uh, attract people to work with you, mm -hmm. um, making the environment friendly for work, uh, figuring, solving problems that Leak, that can avoid conflicts mm -hmm. or dealing mm -hmm. with conflicts in a way that's productive. I think those are all very necessary things. And I, while I'm not an expert in any sp specific ones of those, I think I've got some, some natural um, background in, or some natural God-given abilities in being tolerant. And, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, I've had an interest in humor and, 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 and seeing the value of that telling jokes has in, in, in the right situation at the right time and the wrong times, but the, the, the <laughs> right times is useful. Um, and uh, th actually developed you know, some personal interest in learning about, well, how does this all work? Well, mm -hmm. Why is it that people like to work with people who are more upbeat than downbeat? Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and, and, and so I, you know, in my hobby time, was doing some reading and studying around that. So I think, I think an interest in, in, in the science of mm -hmm. working in groups, um, some abilities in that, and then having a day-to-day -day laboratory of saying, you know, what does it take? Um, mm -hmm. um, I, I you know, realized that a lot of the work is based on relationships and trust and particularly in this interagency environment that if you have the right, if, if you can build up trust, people give you the benefit of the doubt. If you've lost that trust, they assume that you're, you know, you've got another agenda and they'll, they'll withdraw. Mm -hmm. um, and so building mm -hmm. up that trust um, becomes an asset that um, uh, is, should be treasured and, 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 and respected and, and developed. And, I think trying to, you know, appreciating that myself and then seeing um, how I can help others to see that has been part of, uh, I think, you know, one of the learning aspects and I think one of the sharing aspects that I've had the opportunity to do. So how was it working for Bill Steiger and, um, and all that went on in that office? Well, very, very interesting. Um, 
the, what I had known about Bill Steiger before going up there was that he was the guy who was uh, making us um, uh, 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 have every trip that we have taken internationally approved, having every personnel decision approved, um, and very running a very, very tight ship, tighter than we felt like was um, uh, needed for us down at CDC. So I came in with a bit of apprehension about that, you know, having seen that, you know, never having met, well, barely having, I had met him, but haven't worked, worked with him closely. Um, he's still, you know, even after working with him for a long time, he's just, uh, many of those personality traits were still present, but I really realized um, the value that he brought, both in terms of his his intensity and his personality, but also the the fact that he was a political appointee in a position of authority in an initiative like this um, was extremely valuable. So his own personal abilities aside, which were tremendous, he also brought an authority with him by virtue of being a um, you know connected to the White House and. And, um, uh, and, and leadership that people were aware of, that if he said something was going to happen, mm. he could make it happen. Uh, whether he really could, we never really tried to test that, but you, the, the feeling was that he could, you know, his word was very important. Mm. And so I, I learned in this that when, you, when, you're, when your mission is aligned with the political structure, it's extremely valuable, and it's not to be poo-pooed as something, you know, not technical or not, you know, not scientific. It's like real, <laughs> um, and and then and so being working in an office where you could um, you could be helping to guide that power through getting things done was was uh, just you know very interesting and um, dynamic. Um, the, at the same time, there were the global fund was starting, and 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 he was very active in in that as well. Um, but it, it was very it was. Uh, uh, a lot of learning for a, a, you know, a guy from Atlanta to see how Washington works, because I didn't have so much day-to-day -day experience with that. Before. Do you have any particular recollections of meetings or politics, financial issues that stand out in your mind? Well, there were a lot of meetings, um, and there were uh, meetings. You know, some of the things that were most memorable for me were some of the, you know, I was able to be involved in, or, you know, at least a participant in some high-level meetings, like briefing the Secretary Thompson on PEPFAR and joining lunch with Secretary Thompson and, and the Global AIDS Coordinator, Randall Tobias, and Bill Steiger, mm -hmm. you know, having mm -hmm. lunch to force him for lunch and, mm -hmm. and, um, and those kind of things, which mm. I, to me was like, you know, it's just like, like Pretty what, what, exciting. what do they talk about? You know, you learn like, yeah. what do people really talk about and, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that kind of thing. And then there were meetings like um, I was, and one of the things in my role in, at HHS for that year was the, the development of the structures of PEPFAR, like the deputy principals group, which brought together people that were at the leadership group and agency, not the super leadership, but the program leadership who connected the policy to the staff you know, to the personnel structure, the um, and to the field work, and who could really solve problems because they they could navigate all the different angles, and so you had the people from different agencies getting together every week to, you know, go through all of the issues. Of, and you of represented CDC. Yeah, and so I was I was at those meetings uh, uh -huh. from the beginning, and and um, they were you know again very fascinating. The agendas were wide ranging from you know dealing with specific policy issues like how are we going to do this to the budget decisions to just developing the guidance for how do we plan you know how do we how do we structure a planning process um, what forms do we use what indicators are we using for success uh, interpreting the data and making decisions and what technical getting input from the technical it's just everything came together um, in a uh, you know in a somewhat structured but also somewhat nascent and developing way. What, what were your feelings then about CDC's role? You were representing CDC. What, what did you want to get across, or what do you, how, did, how do you think CDC fared in, those, in, those, uh, in that forum? 
the CDC, uh, I felt like, was always struggling for um, appropriate recognition. Um, we tend to be, being in Atlanta, tend to not be quite as facile or as present um, in, you know, in just a variety of ways. Like our kids don't go to school with the kids, you know, in the leader, you know the, with the kids in other agencies or, you know, they don't, you don't see people quite as much. So we're not quite as good, I think, at playing the world of getting things done in Washington. At the same time, we are, you know, obviously extremely powerful and important organization who knows a lot of stuff. And so I felt like we were, one of the jobs was to be recognized for our capabilities. Um, another job was to really try to understand better what differences we bring to the table from what, say, USAID brought to the table, and just really trying to understand that so that we could find common ground and not be battling from like speaking different languages and not knowing even what they're what's driving them as an agency and them not knowing what's driving us as an agency um, if I felt like we had to really get everybody to know what CDC does and then just constantly you know when you've got growing resources people are always fighting over resources mm -hmm. and, and there's always you know tricks that people play or um, you know games or 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 slight spinning of things, and just being always having to be vigilant about um, you know what's what's really happening now. Like what, what 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 are we really talking about here, and what what are the implications of some of the decisions that are being made um, on CDC? I felt always very proud of being. I was you know mm -hmm. if I looked around and said which, which agency do I am I would I like to be being represented here? There was no question that CDC was the cool agency mm -hmm. who had so much capacity. At, back home, um, we were junior in the field, I thought, and I thought we really had a lot to learn, and there were a lot of legitimate critiques about how we operated, both you know, partly in ignorance of knowing all the, uh, how the, the rules of the road in terms of the embassies and, and, and how management's done overseas, um, uh, but also maybe coming more from the technical perspective than the diplomatic perspective. And we, you know, I think the problems that people had in the field were usually not because they knew, didn't know their technical world, but because they didn't know how to behave themselves or operate or, 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 or be smooth enough to develop the relationships overseas. And so recognizing that and being able to communicate back and, and everybody was realizing this, you know, that we really need to make sure that we've got the right combination of, uh, of technical expertise and human inner, you know, emotional intelligence that it mm -hmm. takes to operate. Um, for uh, our just, people in the field. Yes, for our people in the field. Did, were you in a position to try and advocate for resources for CDC, or was that at, at, the higher, at a higher level? Well, the, the, way the, the way the PEPFAR planning process went, most of the resources were allocated on the basis of country-developed plants the the initial the allocation of most of the resources was to the countries you know like this much money went to Tanzania or this much money was allocated to Cote d'Ivoire and it was up to the country teams then to come up with plans that utilize this fund so the real negotiations were more at the country level than at the headquarters level although when things got rolled up then it you know the headquarters had to be really looking at each of the countries and and you know there may be, and then and then there were central projects that we were needing to advocate for. It wasn't more so much to get money; it was to be able to do the activities that we thought were important to, to do, and to not you know to add, and to maybe not spend money on things that we thought were not useful. So it was, really wasn't the amount of money as much as making sure that the the approaches that we thought were important to do could be funded enough to, to, to do them, and, mm -hmm. they, and they, they would be overseen by the right, you know, by people who are technically qualified enough to oversee them. Mm -hmm. So in these deputy principal meetings, um, I guess, did you feel that you were looking out for CDC, looking after CDC, defending CDC? So, yes, yes, some of the time, but most of the time, I would say more of the time was spent feeling like part of a startup organization that was not so much defending our piece of it as much as figuring out how the whole thing should work. Um, the, 
uh, I feel like there was a true spirit of Ambassador Tobias used to say, take your uniforms off at the door uh, in PEPFAR and uh, you know, come in not really there to represent your agency as much as to be part of a bigger, a bigger effort. And I think that was, you know, that, um, that you can only go so far with that, uh, but I felt like we went pretty far with that um, and got to a point where you could have a conversation that, with your peers and other agencies that wasn't always tainted by a feeling like you're trying to get something okay. from me. Good. Um, um, but rather trying to see, well, how can we make this work the best? Um, mm -hmm. Because the stakes are high. Mm -hmm. There's people, we were really trying to you know, help people's lives. And you, you know, you, it's not, you know, there's, there's a bigger mission involved than trying to make sure your agency is getting the right, I, I guess I've always felt confident that we were, that we were always gonna be playing a strong role and, and that um, if we, did the right, if the whole thing did the right, if the whole mission was successful, that our part in it would be part of that. Um, and so while there was energy spent on defending the agency, that wasn't the dominant feeling. The dominant feeling was one of, um, you know, really figuring out how do you do a large, difficult interagency mission working in multiple other countries with real human beings, both operating, uh, um, representing and you know, benefiting from the program. This was um, it's kind of a strong political climate, as, as is often the case. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how, how the political and social environment um, colored PEPFAR, maybe primarily in those early years in terms of Prevention, drug use, prostitution, and so on. What what were some of the um, how did that play out in terms of the policies for PEPFAR, the first PEPFAR? Well, PEPFAR as part of what it brought uh, to the world. Uh, part of it was resources. Part of it was authority or kind of the strength of the U.S. government and the influence that the U.S. government can have. And part of it was um, bringing the science that had developed on how you can prevent HIV transmission, how you can treat people with HIV infection. And so there was, uh, you know, technical guidance was important, although WHO provides its set of guidance um, and we contribute to that. In terms of the guidance towards what we are going to fund to implement, that, you know, PEPFAR put together, you know, said we are going to, you know, we're going to support these, these, these interventions because they have a science base to them. In general, the, there, was not much con there was not so much controversy over most of what we you know, were, were doing. There were some area, you know, there was, I think the biggest controversy was probably over um, the, the allocation, the, the, the issue of prevention and the amount of, um, the, the allocation of funding that was assigned to specific approaches to, to prevention that, you know, involved the, the, the famous ABC program of abstinence, be faithful, and use condoms. There was a, there was, gui there was restrictions on the, on the, on the, the, there needed to be a percentage of the funds that was allocated to that area. And there was controversy over, over that, particularly the, um, you know, controversy over whether this was more of a public health supported pr approach or more of a social, socially oriented ap approach where you know, are we, are we implementing morality? Are we implementing public health? And there, there, and how well? Because there was data that would suggest that maybe abstinence in, in many environments is just very difficult to implement because of the, of the, um, the way the, the dynamic, the, the dynamics that was happening in the sexual encounters that were leading to transmission were not, you know, there was not so much volunteerism to that, perhaps, or there's not the 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 the, the, the opportunity to implement that strategy may be very difficult in many environments. So there was controversy over whether, you know, how much funding should go to uh, the ABC uh, uh, component of this. But I felt like it was, it was not a major piece of the, you know, it wasn't a showstopper in terms of being able to, 
get everybody to agree that PEPFAR is a, you know, a, a good way forward. I mean, there, yes, maybe you could disagree that maybe this isn't the right, maybe we could do better with our approaches, but it was, it was really a relatively smaller part of what we were doing. Um, and over time, I think the, um, you know, when you then have data and you then have, you know, being able to show that what you're doing is effective, you, you, you really can convince people who um, were uh, having, you know, their opinions in play that, that um, you know, there are evidence-based ways of doing this. So I think that was one area. Um, the, uh, there was concern when Ambassador Tobias was named to be the coordinator, uh, having been the CEO of Eli Lilly Company, there was you know, a buzz about, uh, in the very beginning of PEPFAR, this is all a big schema to um, get the, phar the, phar the, the pharmacy industry in the U.S. to be getting a lot of money because they're going to put all their money, they're going to buy all the, you know, buy all the U.S. drugs and all this money that's helping these countries is actually, you know, going through the drug companies to, to and there. And that, you know, that led to, you know, some, the, the beginnings of feeling of, well, may, I wonder if we should really trust this initiative. Um, and, uh, and so it took uh, effort to squash that, but I, I thought a very, a very interesting effort, uh, which was to work with the FDA, have the FDA say that, because um, there, were, there, were, there were two issues with the, with the, the choice between um, going with uh, uh, the, uh, innovative, the innovator companies, the, the major drug companies versus the, um, the uh, uh, generic drug companies. Generic drug, the generic drugs will be very, uh, much more inexpensive. The innovator drugs are the, you know, these companies have invested heavily in the research needed to develop these drugs and need to recoup those resources. And the generic drugs were primarily from India, India and... Uh, uh, India and... Um, some Brazil, some, I yeah, think. Brazil, South yeah. Africa started making mm. uh, at some point. Um, and, um, uh, but WHO had a system for... So, so the issue is, what, are, is the quality good? Is the, are we dealing with a quality issue, or are we dealing with a intellectual property uh, mm -hmm. uh, issue? And I think PEPFAR cleverly dissociated those two by saying, um, we, we really want to make sure that we have the we're not providing lower quality drugs to people in Africa than we are to people in the United States because that's not right to do. Um, so we, we're not going to do that, um, but we're not going to insist that all the drugs that are used be licensed by the FDA for use in the United States because that's not what we're doing with PEPFAR. And furthermore, that that would be very disruptive to our pharmaceutical industry, um, uh, and it would not allow them to, it would be disincentives for continuing to innovate and develop new drugs. So by using the WHO, WHO then had a system for qualifying drugs on their technical merit. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, uh, what PEPFAR did was work with the FDA to develop a new classification for drugs that would call them uh, tentatively approved, uh, meaning that they passed the technical qualifications for being an effective drug. They had the right components, they, the formulation was correct, um, they were handled in a safe ma in a way that didn't degrade their quality. Mm -hmm. um, but they're not necessarily licensed for use in the United States. They haven't, they haven't, they're not, um, they're not fully qualified to, for, for that use. And so by differentiating those and then by saying PEPFAR is willing to invest in these tentatively approved drugs means that PEPFAR can assure the quality uh, and PEPFAR can be providing the low costs. And then uh, furthermore, we can squash the rumor that this was all about bringing, bringing uh, funding to, to the drug companies. Mm. And I think that was, a, and that then very interesting uh, you know, allowed allowed then more more drugs to be bought, more treatment to be provided with the same amount of, of funding. So it really was a clever way of doing, and it also then s s isolated off the um, uh, you know it didn't it didn't it didn't threaten the drug companies so much by saying you know everything's going to be generic. Mm -hmm. there's, there's still, there was still some control over mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. intellectual property side of things. Fascinating history. Um, so you come back to Atlanta, and at that point, uh, you assumed 
a leadership position in, in managing the Global AIDS program. Can you tell us a little bit about your role when you returned to Atlanta? And yeah, I came back uh, to Atlanta. So I was in Washington 2003, 2004. Uh, came back as a, yeah, I was, I was a branch chief in the prevention branch and then moved to the care and treatment branch. Um, we did some shuffling around. Um, and then was taking a stint as the, um, as the deputy director, as an acting deputy director at the time when the, the, the selection was made of a new director. So Eugene McRae was director. He uh, stepped down, and there was a period of an acting director uh, while, a, while a recruitment was undertaken for, for a new director. So a new, um, uh, you know, the new director was brought in from the outs from outside of CDC, from the um, the U.S. UA the military HIV program. Uh, ambassador Debbie Burks, she wasn't ambassador then, but uh, Colonel Debbie Burks or Debbie Burks uh, was chosen to be the director. Um, and uh, at the time, I was acting director. She 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 eventually asked me to stay on as the deputy director. So my role, that was my official role as, as deputy director for the program. I think the, um, th what that meant was I was working with uh, Dr. Burks as, as the um, you know, office of the director and managing you know, this whole thing. I, I continued being on the, the deputy principals group. Uh, we kind of split up or we, we, we together managed the headquarters operations. We figured out a, or we kind of split up the countries in terms of figuring out, well, who else, you know, going to be overseeing the country activities. Um, at, at, at that time, about how many people were, were working for, for CDC? Probably, uh, well, the, in terms of U.S. direct hire people at headquarters in the field, probably two or 300, and then maybe some hundreds more local staff. It, it was a big operation. There was a lot of countries. And how many countries? I don't know. A lot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, there, there was your focus countries of PEPFAR. There was 14 and then eventually 15. And then probably another 10 or so that we were pretty active in um, that were not the focus countries. So in the 20s mm -hmm. of, of countries mm -hmm. uh, around the world. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, and at its peak, I think about 40. So quite possible. Uh -huh. Um, so a huge infrastructure. Yeah, yeah and lots of different, I, I thought of them as different fronts, like I said, I mean, uh -huh. like any other division at CDC, managing all its uh -huh. headquarters people, you know, that means uh -huh. their PMAPs and their, and their, you know, recruiting and their uh -huh. pay and all, you know, and their authority and their organizational structure. Then you have, as an interagency mission, you've got engaging with other agencies and making, you know, working together with all the agencies. So you had a Washington front and all that all that takes to make that work. And then you had this huge field operation where you've got um, uh, field offices and, and, you know, some of them in vulnerable and difficult situations where people are getting shot at or, you know, uh, other things are happening that, you know, you need to be on top of or, and you're needing to help make it work make the program work in these countries. Did you like the, the management aspect? Yeah, of I like the management that? aspect. I think that's, the, uh, I, I moved from, uh, you know, I think probably around the time when I came back from Thailand and that was probably my inflection point between really feeling like I was on top of any particular technical area mm -hmm. and moving more into management and mm -hmm. making things work. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I like that. I think that, that um, there's always interesting challenges. Mm -hmm. uh, you can bring a human element into it because we're always dealing with people. And so, you know, it's, there, you've got all those complexities to deal with and those are, you know, often very difficult, but, uh, but uh, real, real yeah. things. Uh, yeah. Um, you traveled quite a bit during those years also to the field, to, to countries. Um, and to Washington every week for the deputy principals meeting. Oh, to Washington every, every week. Every Monday, I used to go up at seven twenty. Come back at six. What did you find uh, in the countries during 
the early years, 2003, 4, and so on, before the big scale up of antiretroviral therapy. Do you have any particular memories of certain countries? Uh, well, the AIDS. My, most of, yeah, to be honest, my, most of my work, because I was more in management at that point, uh, and also because of the you know, roles that CDC plays, we're not really the hands on doctors for taking care of people, usually. Uh, you know, it was usually several layers removed from okay. real people. Mm -hmm. um, so saying, many opportunities. So most of my observation of how the epidemic was really playing out was usually staged. Um, okay. You know, I would go on site visits and see people. You know, I'd go to places and see people, but they were, you know, they were hand select. They were. It was an environment that was probably, um, you know, not exactly reflective of the real world. So okay. saying, you know, you, we did get to see, you, but you know, you also you also do see the real world. You see clinics where people are waiting for all day long for, for care, patiently waiting, uh, huge, you know, huge flow of patients through, through systems, um, uh, facilities that are, that um, don't have some of the basic things like hand washing or privacy. Um, or shade, um, so just really difficult environments that people were nonetheless coming for services and um, and being being cared for by overworked staff. So you really you got to feel you definitely got to feel for the um, struggles of implementing something as complicated as HIV prevention and treatment in environments that. You know, we're not used to that, and having to really, really build up those capacities at mm -hmm. every level. Mm -hmm. Did did things improve? Do, do you do you remember things improving as the years went by? Did you were you out and about enough to notice that? Yeah, there were things like uh, like versus record keeping, uh, where you you know moved move from log books that were very cumbersome to much more efficient data systems. Facilities themselves, you know, I definitely saw a trend towards improvements in facilities um, where you've got paint and, um, and flow, normal flow. And, mm -hmm. um, and then the, just the, you know, the chance to talk to doctors and nurses, you saw people really, I thought very quickly learning what they need to learn, mm -hmm. uh, being, knowing knowing about even patients who you could again perhaps it was staged, but you know pr I don't think so. You know you can talk to people and they'll know their CD4 count or they'll mm. understand that they need to what the viral load is. So mm -hmm. really, you you do get a feeling like this is working, like th things are getting information and procedures are getting disseminated mm -hmm. in a way that's that's leading to the prevention of HIV. Before we move off that, is there anything else you'd want to say about your time, uh, Deputy Director and Global AIDS Program? So much It was I fascinating. Know. I mean, I, uh, just personally working with Ambassador Burks was a real treat and a real, well, real treat, partly, part treat, partly overwhelming. Um, uh, she's, uh, she brought a vision to the work and a and a, a a confidence in people that was higher than even they had in terms of what they could do and really a knack for pushing people to their limits to you know to get this job done and a real passion for stopping the AIDS epidemic and just observing her and being you know trying to um, I, I played a role sometimes just translating her vision into practice because she sometimes was cryptic and 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 uh, uh, she a very clear image of what she wanted to do. She might say it very quickly and expect it to be done, and people didn't even hear it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. you know, they come up, and I so I'd sometimes be playing the role of, did she, what did she mean? What did we? What, what are we supposed to do? Uh, mm -hmm. Which I didn't always know myself, but I, you know, would it would help to uh, do that. And then just learn, you know, just seeing her her vision and her strategy work. So I think personally, that was a. Um, uh, exhausting but really interesting um, um, time to learn a lot about leadership and uh, strategic thinking and 
and, and human elements. She, you know, she would go, once we went, we flew, we flew out to, to the West Coast for a, like four hours to deal with a personnel problem and then came back to Atlanta. It just, you know, um, bringing somebody in from an overseas site to talk about a personnel issue. So just the, 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 willing, the willingness to go to any end to kind of solve problems was uh, fascinating. Well, there's, there's so much more. Um, but before we end, um, you left CDC in 2010, I think, and um, you want to tell us a little bit about what, what you did after that? Yes, I left. I, uh, I, I, I was in the Commission Corps, and I had completed my 20-year commitment to the Commission Corps in, in 2010. Uh, and I was around 56 years old at the time, and I was thinking, I sh if I'm ever going to do something else, now would be a good time to do it. And there was the the I ended up going to the Elizabeth Glazer Pediatric AIDS Foundation. It's an organization that I, you know, I had be in my because my work often was involved in their mission of of uh, stopping AIDS in children. Uh, I was very you know was familiar with the organization and thought it was really good. A, a, a good one. Um, it was involved in our track one treatment program, for instance. And so I, I, I thought, you know, this would be an interesting place to work, you know, interesting mission. Um, uh, I feel like I would know what, you know, know, know what they're doing, but really have a different, you know, have a, have a new perspective to, to offer. Can you, just to, for a moment, can you tell us when and why it was created? And, and yeah, yeah, Elizabeth Glazer, Peter, it was named after Elizabeth Glazer who um, was uh, herself infected with HIV through um, a, a blood transfusion. She then went on and infected, unbeknownst to her, infected uh, two of her children. One of them died. One of them is still alive and, and healthy on treatment. Um, and, but at the time that her, this was early in the epidemic, this was in the early 1980s, there was nothing, there was no, Interventions for children, and so she was a she was an advocate. She was plugged into Hollywood and politics through her husband Paul Glazer, who was an actor in Starsky and Hutch on TV. And so she had access to you know to soapboxes, and she she herself was just a very strong advocate. So combine the combination of and she died and she died of HIV herself, uh, but not bef but not until she was able to launch a mission to, mm. to address AIDS in children. Um, mm. And I think it's that having an organization, working in an organization where you have that kind of like mm. starting story mm -hmm. and that, that continues to draw people into work on it. It's a, you know, it affects people personally. They want to help contribute to that. Um, it was part of its attractiveness and part of its effectiveness as an organization. Uh, it allowed me to see, see how you could, like the US government doesn't quite have that kind of mission statement, um, you know, we're a very different kind of organization. So seeing, um, you know, having a smaller organization, strong mission, a little bit more flexible in terms of how you can influence things than in the U.S. government, all those were very attractive and I think a very positive part of that experience. I got to see CDC from the perspective of somebody who gets money and needs to follow CDC regulations and um, uh, how was that? What, how, how was it getting money from CDC and needing to follow their regulations? Uh, one thing I realized working in a, in a non-governmental organization like that is you're always needing to think about where your next dollars are coming from. Um, in, in the U.S. government, we have a very, you know, kind of a different flow of resources through Congress and uh, in a different process. In an NGO like this, it's always like, you know, okay, we got a grant for this period. We got 15 grants putting together. So you're always you're always trying to find business, and that's, mm -hmm. that's one aspect of it. But the other is you're you're really on the ground more more at a closer level than the U.S. government is. You're hiring the people in the clinics. You're 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 buying the equipment. You're really in the in the thick of things. So I actually saw more more about the AIDS epidemic in my field visits with Elizabeth Glazer, Pediatric AIDS Foundation, or different, a different aspect to it yeah. there than I uh, even did from, from CDC. So it was very good. I moved, ended up coming back to CDC because it was geographically difficult to work in Washington. Uh, my wife kept her job in, 
in Atlanta, oh. and so we, we were doing some commuting that didn't... didn't you must have a lot of frequent sense. flyer miles over the years. Yeah, I'm getting close Did to you become a platinum? I'm getting close to three million miles <laughs> in Delta. <laughs> <laughs> um, so then you, you came back to CDC, and, and now currently... Yeah, I came back to CDC in, the, in the, what's now the Division of Global HIV and TB. So the, it's, the, it's the descendant of the initial Global AIDS program as a, a regional manager. So we've developed a structure to over, have a full-time position overseeing the offices in a number of countries. And I was overseeing the Asia and Europe offices. Mm. Um, and... Uh, then had the so did that for a couple of years and then now I'm in the process of transitioning to be the uh, country director for CDC's office in China. Um, mm. a, a chi as China is now developing its own um, its its own economy, allowing it to have the resources to run its own public health system. They're still interested in seeing how they can be global health players themselves and look to to U.S. CDC to be you know, teachers in a way of helping helping the China CDC to develop their global health capacity. So we'll be working working um, uh, in that kind of environment with a new, you know, a, a, another global health player in China. So come full circle from your early studies of Chinese at uh, in Pittsburgh. Yes. How is your Chinese? Do you, is it functioning for you at all in terms of communicating? I noticed that since I started studying Chinese, I, I've gotten older. <laughs> and uh, it's I, much I, harder to learn a language. It's older. harder. It's harder to even remember the English words and the English names. But I, I we'll see. Come back in a couple of years and ask me. I, uh -huh. I've, I've got a base that I hopefully I can draw on. Yeah. Um, and and uh, we'll see. Yeah. Um, well, gosh, it's in conclusion. You've you've played a leading role in. in so many aspects of, of the HIV AIDS epidemic. Um, any concluding thoughts on, on how this has affected you and, and your family? Well, personally, I just feel like I've had a very lucky career. You know, almost like coming in, um, coming into working on HIV AIDS at the beginning of my CDC career, being present in a time when you began having an intervention to prevent children from becoming infected, the opportunity to help with that in the U.S., help with that in Thailand. That experience itself in Thailand um, contributed to the confidence that the U.S. government had in investing more heavily. And so the, in the, in the preventing mother-to-child transmission became an important key mm -hmm. to unlocking the resources for HIV-AIDS. So and it's the ability to be following all that through my career and applying, you know, my epidemiology initially and my, um, you know, intercultural abilities that developed along the way and my management experience, being able to apply different things at different components of that, it's just been very rewarding. Um, my, my family had to put up with, my, you know, a lot of absence of me, um, that, uh, that's never easy and that, uh, uh, but, Fortunately, this parallels the the uh, history of email. I remember getting my very first emails when I did my first visits to Thailand and for my kids. And so I think the communications helped, but it doesn't. Uh, there are sacrifices that people that, that your families makes when you are engaged in something as all-consuming as, as this. So it's a balance of being part of something big that's very important uh, and trying to. Um, play the unique role that you have as a, as a father and a husband all at the same time. But you do what you can do. Yeah, I, it sounds like you've done a pretty good job. Thanks very much. Well, thank you.